chapter 35, ecologies in, or I'm sorry, communities in ecology. So chapter 35 really focuses how the, how living things function, um, in a certain environment, right? Or a certain space. So this is just going to be a really quick review of how things interact with each other, their environment, all that stuff. So a couple things, dominance, right? Ecological dominance. Many communicate, sorry, many communities are dominated by a few species, okay? We call them the dominance. So we're not talking about um, necessarily their place on the food chain. We're talking about how much of them there are. So for example, plants would be considered a, a, a dominant in some cases, especially some of the northern environments that are colder, because there's just so much of it. Um, so you're not necessarily thinking, okay, ready guys, ready for this analogy? You're not necessarily thinking of like LeBron James, one um, um, you know, amazing athlete. You're thinking more of like a lot. So it'd be like the 1990s Bulls when they won all those championships. Yeah, you can thank me for that analogy later. So in addition, one example of this dominance is by the keystone species. And these are species that would dramatically affect a community. So I think I mentioned this to some of you the other day about the otters. So the otters have a very um, special place in, say, like an, um, in an Arctic food chain right? They are food, yes, for seals and killer whales, but then they also feed off some of the lower organisms. So if we, for example, were to get rid of the otters, you'd see an overabundance of like krill or um, uh, different types of fish, different types of aquatic animals. And at the same time, you'd see on the other end, you'd see a decrease in certain populations of whales, of seals, of sea lions, who feed on the otter. So if you remove the otter, you're, you're, um, you would see a huge shift in the, um, the populations, right? You'd see on the lower end, you'd see an abundance because these people, these people, because these organisms would be going crazy because their predator isn't there. On the other hand, you'd see the larger organisms suffering because their food source is gone. Also, otters, I'm obsessed with otters. They are, if you look there, you probably know this, but they all sleep like holding hands um, so they don't drift away. And it's basically the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. The Shedd Aquarium for the past couple of years has adopted several little baby otters or rescued baby otters. And I will literally sit on their YouTube and just replay, replay, replay all of the cute little um, otter videos. Um, uh, they're, they're all, they also can be very nasty as well, but we can, we can, we'll focus on the positive. So here we kind of talked about this in class, biodiversity. Um, so biodiversity, bio life diversity variation. So you have a, a, you have a number of different types of living things. This is great because it's going to increase productivity. And we look, we, <laughs> sorry about that. It's good because um, productivity is um, defined as the amount of solar energy, right, that organisms can capture and transform into living things. Keep in mind that, that the transformation of light energy into chemical energy is what makes life possible here. So the more that is going on in, an, in a community or in an ecosystem, the more um, you're going to see and the stronger you'll see that, that community and the more types of different populations you'll see there in species, which is what you want because that the, it, it helps to just strengthen um, overall living, you know, the living space, the ecosystem, the community. Um, we, talked, we can talk about this when we talk about genetic diversity, right? We see so many dogs being inbred. So there's not a lot of genetic diversity in a lot of these dogs. We see them getting cancers at a young age or young... Yeah, young age, we see them dying young, we see them having hip problems, all that kind of stuff. Um, bulldogs are a great example of this too. Adorable, cute, but just so many like allergies and things because they're just so inbred. So the, diff the more variety we can have in our communities and in life, um, the, the stronger we will be, essentially. So there's my, there's my positive affirmation for the day. So let's talk about niche or niche. So we talk about ecological um, niche and habitat, right? Habitat is where something lives. The, the niche is what it does. What's the role that it plays? 
Um, it can be, it can include its interaction in the environment, kind of like the habitat. It can um, focus on how it gets energy, what it feeds on. Um, it can also be what is it food for or how does it interact with other species. We saw this too. Yes, predation is one of those, but you, we also see mutualism, right? We also see that is definitely part of an organism's niche. Comp now, here's the <laughs> competition. So this is what it sounds like. You've got limited resources, and you've got two different types um, of either individuals or species fighting for those limited resources. We see this in northern Illinois when it comes to a lot of our... Um, like deer, for example, or rabbits, they are, with all the development that's happened over the past 30 years in northern Illinois, we've taken away their habitat. So now you've got a limited number of resources and a lot of, or and a lot of um, animals hunting for them. So what's happened, though, is that so there's two different types, intraspecific and interspecific. Um, so in the intraspecific, um, basically each individual is harmed. No one wins. In the interspecific, yeah, um, not only are the species harm, but the, re the resources are harmed as well. So intraspecific, you're just seeing a, a, you're seeing a negative impact on the individual organisms. In interspecific, it's the organisms, organisms that are getting harmed, as are the resources. So it's a lose, 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 lose. One way we see this as invasive species, and we're going to talk about this a lot because this is very um, common in, in our environment, right? Um, I'll give you some examples like um, in a second. Asian carp is one. So what happens is you have a species that's not native to the environment. Um, they come there or, and they're brought there or whatever, and there's no predator. There's nothing to keep that population in check. So what happens is they go, um, they go, they go, their populations boom, right? And they start to take away resources from other animals and plants that live there and are native there and have been there for thousands and millions of years. Some examples are the kudzu, which is um, a type of bush. Asian carp, first of all, if you've ever seen an Asian carp, they're disgusting. Um, they've been a huge issue in the Great Lakes. Um, Chicago and Illinois and Wisconsin have done a number of things to kind of keep them from, from creeping through. Um, zebra mussel also has been an issue in um, the uh, Great Lakes. And you've got oh, the little Australian rabbits. If you look down there, there's a picture of all those rabbits just going crazy. Um, so, yeah, so let's take the Asian carp. First of all, they're disgusting. Second of all, they come over, um, and we think they were brought over probably with trade or something. They were, came over kind of like rats, right? Rats came from China because through they were stowaways, right? Asian carp, same thing, right? They were brought over in some capacity, and they found their ways to the Great Lakes, and they exploded. No one wants to eat the Asian carp. No one wants to mess with the Asian carp. So they're just taking over, and they're robbing resources from the other native plants and animals that help to keep that ecosystem in balance. So, okay, a couple things. It was going to be first is mimicry. That's when something looks like something. Um, there's two different types, malarian and uh, betazin. Basically, the first one is when you've got some a bunch of organisms that look alike and don't taste well, don't taste very good. That's a word. That's a phrase. So wasps, bees, hornets, um, they're not delicious, and they they look very similar. So their predators are going to stay away. Same with the monarch and the viceroy butterflies. Um, the betasin is a little different. You have a disgusting species. And another species that could be quite delicious, but it looks like the disgusting species. Um, like, let's take the king snake and the coral snake. Venomous coral snake is going gonna, is gonna to hurt you. King snake won't, but you might not know the difference. So that's kind of how they've ev ev evolved and adapted to better fit into their environment. Again, that's an interaction that those species have with their surroundings. Um, I think this is the last one, symbiosis. So symbiosis, we've covered this. This is commensalism. This is mutualism. This is parasitism. Um, predation is different, obviously, because one species is basically, or individual is being eaten by another for, for energy purposes. So this is more of a, um, symbiosis also is over an extended time. Predation happens in minutes or hours. Symbiosis is going to happen for a while. And it's, it's important for 
the organisms to keep each other alive, basically. So the plus plus and the plus minus just means um, who's benefiting or who's not benefiting. Mutualism is a win-win. We know that. A little Nemo and a little sea anemone, right? Cute, cuddly. They both live together. Great. Um, or Rose and, and Bee might be a better one because that's more of a, um, a clearer example of um, mutualism. They both benefit. Parasitism. Um, like our tick, right? Our tick doesn't want to kill us right away, or that tapeworm doesn't want to kill us right away. It wants to keep us alive for as long as possible because we're providing food for it. However, it also negatively hurts, it negatively impacts us. So parasitism would be a plus minus. It helps one individual, it harms another. Commensalism is going to be a plus um, zero. It helps one, but in the, uh, in, um, but it doesn't, the, Many cases, the other organism doesn't even know it's there, like your egret and your cape buffalo, although that could be mutualism, or your whale and your barnacles, right? The barnacles really don't hurt the whale unless it gets to be out of control, and maybe it starts to, or the whale gets sick. Um, for the most part, they have no idea they're there. They're just swimming, swimming through life. And neutralism is when either organism doesn't even know the other's there. Okay, I think that is it for us. Um... Great. If you have questions or if you need clarification on anything that I've covered, um, be sure to write them down and we will talk about them the next time we're in class together. Thank you so much.